So, uh, do you have any comments or from the commissioners or, or questions that you would uh, like to make or put them down on? So, uh, I, was, I was encouraged with the response that uh, uh, our chairman gave uh, right at the end of the public session. session there. Muted. I can't remember the Canadian that got up and asked about the international aspect that he thought should be part of the pro protocol committee. And so, I'm very um, encouraged to proceed down that type of format where uh, we have uh, Canadian and U.S. participants on, on, um, from, the, from the commission side uh, in meeting with uh, the uh, similar participants from the uh, North Pacific Fishery Management Council. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd just like to put a plug in for your, your last uh, comments there and for a direction for, for us six to, to maybe go down. I'm not sure what the next step in finalizing numbers and, and, and that type of thing is, but I am uh, um, very encouraged with the comments you made there at the, at the end of the public session. Thank you. So I, I think our, our uh, and we can continue to, to discuss it, but I think if we found that as a commission acceptable, we would include that in our letter back to the council saying uh, thanks for the presentation on the draft framework and we want to participate and Bruce has a draft of that started as I recall and so I looked at it earlier. That's correct Mr. Chairman that was distributed to you yesterday. All right. Any thoughts from Canada? Um, well I, I think that's what I said in the, the other room like I would like to proceed with <coughs> having uh, some formal relationship on a bilateral level with um, the Halibut Commission and uh, with the Council. So, um, you know, whether it's uh, one or, or three from each side, um, more of a detail to me, but I think probably it's uh, at least two, though, from each side. Thank you. I think that is something that would be useful to put in without being, as far as I'm concerned, demanding, but I think we should have two from each side at least, and perhaps three, but I'm, I'm, we could discuss that. Maybe we could say, uh, of course, it, makes a f it may make a difference to the council. If all six of us were on it, they might want to have a larger group than if only four of us were on it to, to meet in a joint uh, session. I guess, um, I mean, I've been having a chance to go through the draft terms of reference <coughs> to be upfront about this, but, you know, it's not clear to me that this is actually a well, it's not a decision-making body, so um, whether the numbers are uh, uh, four or six, I, I don't know that it really matters. We're not like voting, I don't think. Yeah. And uh, it's better to, what I read in the actual document that is that it's more about coordinating our activities and better communication between uh, the parties. Thank you for that. I think that's right. and. So, uh, hearing that, I, I guess I don't see any reason for not suggesting that all six of us would be part of that. And, of course, if they're face-to-face -face meetings and travel is involved, it's conceivable that not all of us would be able to make it. But we certainly want to have both parties represented at any meeting. And uh, if, we met, if it was a phone conversation or a phone meeting, virtual meeting, whatever we call those, uh, that's... I don't, I don't see any reason not to have all six people on it. Um, I would be interested if Dan had a, a comment about what he saw and how the, the council saw the, uh, the uh, I'll call it the international, <laughs> moving forward, whether that was discussed at the council and what views that they might have discussed. Dan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Ryle. We did not have a detailed discussion about um, a joint body composed of um, Canadian U.S. commissioners and U.S. council members. Um, I think the 
main decision point might be whether it's all six commissioners or a subset. Um, <clears throat> as you said, there it's not a decision-making body. Um, however, meeting to communicate and coordinate on issues of mutual interest is, I think, is critical um, in a number of uh, areas and issues. We, as I said um, in the other room, we didn't discuss the terms of reference in a lot of detail either. So I think to the extent that um, you have uh, suggestions, we were interested to hear them. Um, and again, as we developed our draft agenda for our joint meeting in last February, we also outlined how we might work together to achieve our the respective objectives of the two bodies. So those are kind of the high points um, that I can uh, comment to you about. Um, I don't have any more, I don't think, unless I hope that that answers is to some extent. Yeah, it does. Thanks very much, Jan. I mean, I think maybe um, maybe I could hear from the other Canadian commissioners. We haven't had a chance to talk about this, but uh, did you have any comments before I go? So I think that um, it would be useful to maybe talk today about, well, we're planning on providing a, a letter back that would be supportive of the concept. And uh, maybe we should talk about what some next steps might be. Um, do we, when do we envision the group getting together? The, one of the first activities could be around the terms of reference. Um, and uh, that would be, or that could be done via, you know, exchange of email. But um, I do think it's probably going to be useful to get together uh, sooner than later and that um, one could go through the process of terms of reference, but I think it would be useful to get together in person to talk about some more substantive items than just, uh, um, you know, agreeing upon a terms of reference. Thank you, uh, Paul. So would you suggest that we develop this letter over the next couple of weeks uh, by email uh, rather than being able to draft it and, and sign it off here, but uh, complete this item by uh, recognizing that we are, we want to form this. We, we may, uh, in the letter, suggest a time, and we might suggest what the next year, the first parts of the terms of reference uh, as we develop that letter over the next few days. Yeah, that's what I, you put it much more clearly and I was kind of rambling. <laughs> but I would like to do that, Jim, and I think that um, we could maybe give some indication of what we saw some topics could be potentially. And I don't have any in mind right now, but I think we could have a, dis a discussion around that and include that in the letter that would help um, uh, lead to a fruitful discussion between the Commission and the Council. Thank you. So if any commissioner has the thought right now, we can do that. Otherwise, we can s submit those by email as we draft a letter going forward. Bob, your mic's on. I don't know if that's because Oops. you were going to say something. No, it wasn't. Jeff, any thought? I guess I'd just like to say that I support your thoughts of uh, trying to get this formed into a response letter to the council and also Paul's thoughts about uh, trying to get together in a more substantive way. Um, in the near future rather than maybe debating here today. Okay, thank you. So perhaps uh, we had an opportunity for some public in the other session. Perhaps we just should discover if there's any public comment in this room right now on this particular issue uh, before we uh, dispense with it. Anyone wishing to say anything? I see none, so I... I I actually don't see making further progress right here in this session. We will try to develop the letter and, and along those terms that we suggested, expanding a little on terms of reference and next step uh, as, as we uh, edit it by email. And uh, I think that's all we can do here this morning. Yeah, that works for me. Okay. And, and, and in an effort to keep 
on the published agenda. I think we will stop for now and come back at, I was looking, I couldn't remember if it was 1 or 1.30, but uh, we're scheduled to come back at 1.30. So that would give us two and a half hours. So everyone can take a nap. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Participants who are going to join us. Okay. Whoever, whoever wants to orchestrate the order of those, please do. Yeah. Yeah. Which tab would be at the? Uh, oh, I'm having this issue with my virus thing not letting my computer turn on. So. Ready? Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sarah Williams. I am the National Marine Fisheries Service West Coast Regional Rep. We do have a uh, full cast of characters from 2A for you this afternoon. Um, I'm going to give the NIMS report, then I have their state agency folks here to talk about sport fisheries, and Mr. Phil Anderson is here as our new council rep, and he's going to start us off. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, commissioners. Nice to see everyone. Um, I'm just going to cover a couple of topics and then uh, turn it over to Sarah before we hear from our state folks regarding the halibut fishery in Area 2A. And as Sarah said, I was uh, designated by the, by the Pacific Fishery Management Council to represent their interests here at your annual meeting and appreciate uh, the opportunity to be back. Haven't uh, been for a few years, but uh, see a lot of familiar faces, even though it's been a few years. Um, I wanted to start by acknowledging the service that Dr. Lehman has given to this commission. Um, he's been a strong advocate for the resource. He's been a strong advocate for science-based management and has been a champion for management strategies that result in having sustainable fisheries during his tenure here. He's always been willing to come to the Pacific Council and help us work through uh, issues and challenges that we had with implementing and managing the halibut fishery in our area consistent with the policies and directives from this commission. And um, on a personal note, I wanted to thank him for his friendship and your your service um, to the state of Washington as, as in your duties with the commission. So thank you. I want to talk uh, just a little bit about bycatch mortality reductions in, in Area 2A, and I think most of you are familiar that we've made a number of advances in that, in that regard. You may recall that the council implemented what we refer to as a catch air program in our trawl fishery back in 2000. 11, and prior to that year, uh, bycatch mortality in our ground fish trawl fishery had ranged from, uh, um, well, looking back about uh, a little more than 10 years, back in 2001, it was as high as 570,000 pounds, and, and even in 2010, it was 300,000 pounds. So we had a, when you look at what the fishery CEY was in Area 2A, it was making up a, a, a good part of that. So the council went through a extended process to get a catch air program in place. And one of the um, objectives of that catch air program was to reduce bycatch and wastage. And that certainly happened with um, that fishery as it relates to halibut. Uh, since then, the bycatch mortality in that fishery has been um, between 44 and 51, 52,000 pounds 
or six, excuse me, 51,000 um, in 2011, 60, about 67,000 pounds in 12, about 53,000 in 2013, and we're at about 44,000 pounds in that fishery in 2014. And uh, so you look at that, and even you look at our bycatch mortality in our fixed gear fishery, and it was actually a thousand pounds more than what we had in our troll fishery this past, in 2014. So uh, pretty, pretty uh, happy about that outcome, and um, moving in a in a in a good direction. I did want to call um, your attention, and I'm not necessarily assuming that you have your blue book in front of you, but on page 174, table 4, it, it uh, talks about the um, the values for um, the fishery CEY uh, in that table uh, for the various areas. And under the first column there, under 2A, uh, you'll see a commercial wastage of, of uh, 0.02 and a bycatch of 0.09. And actually, you're in those numbers. You're double counting the 0 0.02, because our total bycatch uh, mortality was, in fact, 0 0.09, which includes our uh, wastage from our commercial fishery. Our um, so it's for all all commercial sectors is that number, and you'll find that information uh, in the report from NOAA Fisheries. Um, which is entitled the Pacific Halibut Bycatch in U.S. West Coast Fisheries, um, and it's dated September 2015, and I can leave you that report so you can reconcile those numbers. Relative to our catch sharing plan, you, you of course know that we have a catch sharing plan, and Sarah's going to touch on a, a little bit about a little more about that. But every year, we the Pacific Council does go through a process to update the catch sharing plan as needed. We made about three different changes in that plan that this year, which were really minor, all having to do with sport fisheries and days of the week fished and those kinds of things. So I won't bore you with that with that detail. But again, we would ask your approval, as you have done in the past, of our catch sharing plan. So with that, um, if there's no questions, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Um, so on the catch sharing plan, um, I know Jeff's been around, but just as a refresher for some of you and just because uh, this is my favorite picture to show people about our catch sharing plan. So do not feel overwhelmed that there is going to be a pop quiz at the end of this. You do not have to memorize this graphic, I promise. But. This is in our council briefing book. I realize we do not submit this to you guys, and I will start doing that next year because I do think that it's it's a it's a one-page snapshot of what our catch sharing plan does, and so I will rectify that next year for you guys. Um, this is the 2015 Pacific Halibut catch sharing plan, and really just to walk you through a little bit of this. So starting on the left is the two-way tack. Then our catch sharing plan has our first two major divisions for our tribal fishery, which then goes to a tribal ceremonial and subsistence allocation, and, their, and then the tribal commercial fishery, and then 65% of the non-tribal fishery. So that's all the remaining fisheries. Then off of that, sort of in the second column there, you see we have a commercial allocation and then sport allocations to each of the three states. And then all the way farther downstream there, you see we have a bunch of uh, different areas within the states. We have sp um, spring fisheries, we have nearshore fisheries, we have all different kinds of fisheries. And the take home message to me of this is just to show you um, how complicated area 2A is for a very small quota and how many different uh, user groups we have. So three states and that tribal allocation is there. Are currently 13 treaty tribes that have rights to fish halibut. Now, not all 13 of those tribes necessarily fish, but um, that's just to help you think about that for, you know, what the two-way tack is generally in the ballpark of a million pounds. So we do all of that with 
within that. So it's a very well-managed, very co-managed fishery between all of those user groups. So I will leave you with that for that portion of that. Um, okay, so turning to our catch report, this is the overall report for all of the fisheries in Area 2A. And because we have folks here from each of the state agencies, I'm going to focus primarily on the non-tribal commercial fisheries and the tribal fishery and let the state folks that are here give you the details of their sport fisheries. So this report is the report on the 2015 Pacific halibut fisheries in Area 2A. And on page one is our first fishery is our incidental halibut catch and our salmon troll fishery. So this is part of the commercial allocation that goes uh, directly to incidental take of halibut in, the, in our salmon troll fisheries up and down the west coast. Uh, Pre-season set by the council, we have a landing limit that's generally some amount of uh, halibut per some number of Chinook with a maximum amount. It's monitored in season and then we make adjustments to make sure that the quota is fully available for the year. This year, due to uh, quota attainment, the incidental retention was closed on August 20th, and that fishery came in at uh, just under 29,000 on a quota of about 29,000, so they were just under that quota. Uh, next in our commercial fishery is the directed commercial fishery. I can't remember if it was Bruce or Heather mentioned yesterday, this is the last uh, derby style fishery, so this is those short 10-hour uh, openings. Um, sort of true to the last couple of years, we had two openings for this fishery, so two 10-hour openings on June 24th and July 8th, and that fishery closed, as Heather mentioned yesterday, um, just a little bit over the quota, so the catch was about 180,000 pounds um, on a quota of just under, just around 164,000, so slightly over the quota for 2015. And the last non-tribal commercial fishery is our fishery that is incidental to our sable fish primary fishery. So this is our uh, individual quota sable fish fishery on the west coast. This allocation comes off of the Washington sport allocation. It is not an allocation out of the commercial fishery. And this um, incidental take is only allowed with longline gear and only in Washington. Uh, this year was the first year since I've been doing halibut, and I th think and anybody I've picked their brain can remember that we actually had to close this incidental retention before the end of the season at the end of October. So on September 1st, we had to close incidental halibut retention in the sable fish fishery. And the fishery resulted in a catch of... Uh, just about 9,800 pounds on a quota of about just over 10,000, so it's a little bit under that quota. So turning now in this report to page four, um, page three is primarily the sport fisheries, and I'll let the state folks go over that. The last fishery is our tribal fishery. Uh, this fishery uh, in 2015 had kind of its normal schedule where they had a 48-hour opener in March, and this was an unrestricted fishery, so there were no limits per boat. And then a second opening of 30 hours on April 1st that had a 500 pound per vessel per day limit. So in total, both of those fisheries resulted in a catch of about 315,000, which was um, just shy of 8,000 pounds over that allocation. And I did have one update on the table. So there's a, a large summary table at the end of this. Um, I did get the ceremonial and subsistence number for this table near the top, which was 33,100 which brings the total that we have so far to 918,038 pounds. I would note that we don't have the Puget Sound Sport numbers, but that's kind of uh, typical for the reporting cycle for that fishery. We generally don't have those at this time. And with that, I turn it over to the sport folks. Do you guys have questions? So either to, to Phil or Sarah, uh, I know that there's a, a significant amount of port sampling to, to monitor all this. Could you kind of go through a little bit uh, of that, uh, what's involved and in, in in how extensive it is? 
For the directed commercial fishery? For, for the uh, uh, sport fisheries. I am going to let the state folks do that because I do not. <laughs> it is a lot. That is what I know of it. Is that it's it's a very intense uh, intense monitoring because we're doing the sport fishery in season is. I mean we're getting weekly updates for. Uh, it's very intensely managed, but I will let them speak to that. Thanks. So this is the entire uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council and NIMS West Coast report. Is that right? Yes. So do we have questions? for these two groups. Paul, please. Yeah, I had um, two questions. I, it's uh, an impressive uh, allocation chart, and uh, I was kind of curious about two things about it. One is, how long did it take to uh, <laughs> be generated, and, um, and what process did you go through? I think Phil would actually. Um, thanks very much uh, for that question. Um, we developed a catch sharing plan, I uh, believe it was in 1995, through the Pacific Fishery Management Council process. Um, it was um, difficult, as you can imagine, to put together because of all the allocation implications. Um, at the time, we were coming off a federal court decision, a subproceeding of U.S. v. Washington that provided or didn't provide that tribes secured by their treaties 35 percent of the 2A TAC where we had been managing it for a 25 percent value of the TAC to the treaty tribes. And so that put some more pressure, if you will, on the non-treaty segments of the fishery. And um, so we worked, um, I was on the council at the time, and I worked closely with Commissioner Alverson, who was um, very active uh, in that process at the time, well, he still is. And um, we worked with our counterparts in Oregon uh, to develop this catch sharing plan and then bring it forward, um, and it was approved by the council. Thanks uh, for the ex explanation, Phil. And uh, I had one follow-up question about the sablefish fishery that was uh, closed. What do you attribute that to? Is it as far as um, were there more people fishing, or was it abundance? Or I think this year, and Heather, when she comes up, maybe she can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, I don't think that there was a larger amount of participation. I think it was just better fishing this year. It's not a huge number of boats that land into that fishery. I want to say it was like 15 boats? 22, thank you. I'm fixing up numbers. Yeah. May I? Um, we heard uh, anecdotal reports from people participating in that fishery that they were shaking large quantities of halibut in the prosecution of their directed sablefish fishery, and I think um, whether it was availability or abundance, there was an increase, a substantial increase in the bycatch of halibut in that fishery this year. And uh, even though we put uh, ratios on that fishery in terms of limiting the number of halibut could be taken, it was the ratio was determined per 1,000 pounds of sablefish, you could have so many halibut not to exceed an amount. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. I imagine it's in the report. That had been working in the past to keep the fishery at or below, well, actually it was fairly well below the quota. But in this year, where the um, incidental catch of halibut increased so fairly dramatically from the anecdotal reports I've received from fishermen participating in the fishery that it caused us to bump up against that quota. Thank you. So on that, these are anecdotal reports. Are there observers on those civil fish? fishing boats? No, that's not the, so that, that fishery is an IQ fishery for stable fish, but it's not 100% observed. Yeah, it's about 25% yeah, observed. So you do get some data on shaking, mm -hmm. as you call it. So. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Not. thank you very much for the report. Thank you. So we will have sports. State, state, state folks, I don't, please. You want to go north to south? Sure. Make it easy. What's your suggestion?
Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Heather Reed with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Oh, this is much better. <laughs> um, Heather Reed with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'll be going through our report, which uh, summarizes the Pacific halibut fisheries in Washington, and I got information um, also to share on the enforcement report of halibut um, enforcement activities um, in 2015 as well. So as Sarah mentioned, our um, fisheries in 2A are outlined in the Pacific Fishery Management Council's catch sharing plan. Um, for Washington, our recreational fisheries are divided into four um, management areas. We have uh, three management er areas on the outer coast. Our north coast um, areas cover the area um, from the CQ River down to the Queets River. Our central coast or the south coast fishery goes from the Queets River to Leadbetter Point. And then our Columbia River area goes from Leadbetter Point um, down to Cape Falcon, Oregon. Starting with our no north coast sub area, um, the season structure in this area has changed very little in, in recent years. We've really tried to focus on providing um, access to the resource and the quota is caught in a very short amount of time in our north coast management area and so what we've really tried to focus on is a season structure that allows us to notify anglers um, relative to upcoming closures once the quota is reached or potential reopenings if there's enough quota for another fishing day. In the North Coast sub area, um, this year the total catch in that area um, was uh, caught after three days was 94,698 pounds. Um, this is the first time that that sub area season lasted only three days. Typically, um, the last few years, it's lasted four days. Um, so as we're looking to 2016, we're um, looking at some changes to uh, kind of address that shortest season. The um, total catch in that area actually was below the sub area allocation of 108,000 pounds. So there were 13,300 pounds remaining at the end of that um, season, which is not enough to allow for another fishing day in that area. Um, for the south coast sub area, very similar to the north coast, the quota is caught in, in relatively few days, so it has been um, typically lasting about five days. The season uh, is open two days a week on Sunday and Tuesdays. It's also subdivided in, to allow for some incidental retention in the near shore area, so a small portion of that sub area quota is set aside. This year, um, the all-depth season um, was caught after four days um, for a total of 38,914 pounds, which left about 1,800 pounds of quota remaining, not enough for another all-depth day, but was that remaining quota was shifted to a near shore, and um, that near shore area remained open through July 19th. And, uh, all area near shore and all depth combined at the end of the season left only six pounds of the total sub area quota remaining. So the Columbia River sub area is co-managed with WDFW and ODFW. Um, the catch numbers I have here are um, just for Washington. We have in recent years really looked to try to provide um, more fishing opportunity in this area. It's the one area where um, fisheries have not been achieving the quota. So um, we've added more days a week that the fishery is open. We have also um, removed a, a split in the quota that was designed to um, extend the quota throughout the entire summer. So there was a portion reserved for the spring and then a, a little bit left for the late summer. In the last few years, that effort hasn't been there in the late summer, so we removed the, the late and just combined it all into one, let the 
uh, season just run continuously. That's really helped. Um, in 2015, the all-depth fishery opened on May 1 and continued four days a week. That's open Thursday through Sunday. The fishery did um, achieve their quota on June 2nd, so for the first time in many years, we were able, or we we needed to close the fishery before the end of the season in September. Um, a small amount of this quota was also reserved for a near shore fishery. Um, that went, has been going kind of slow, but um, we haven't taken, it's only 500 pounds that's set aside for that. It allows for someone who's bottom fishing in the near shore area. If they do catch a halibut, they can keep it in that um, near shore area, 190 pounds were, um, were caught there. So our Puget Sound area is, um, we don't have the in-season ability to track the quota and close the fishery upon attainment of the quota as we do on the coast. It's structured a little bit different. Um, so we have, um, typically, we don't set that season until after the annual meeting here where we have the quota and next week we'll go home, meet with stakeholders and set the 2016 season. We um, will also go into a little bit about our catch estimation methods, where we are in that um, too in a, in a bit. Our seasons have been, they've gone from a month-long fishery, month-long fishery to day-long fishery in the Puget Sound region. Similar to our coast, um, 2015, the season was open a total of 11 days. Um, we've worked to really, oh, there's two regions in the Puget Sound. One region um, that we call the western region in the CQ area, and then one that covers a little more central of our Puget Sound. We've overlapped the season dates in there to uh, really try to provide as many days as possible to the area combined. Um, so relative to the estimates for the Puget Sound area, we have been working um, since 2010 in response to a recommendation by the Federal Marine Recreational um, Information Program to, to look to our sam sampling methodologies and improve um, our site selection process. So it's the process that um, is used to send our samplers out to different areas and then secondarily to that, apply a weighting factor to improve our estimates coming out from the Puget Sound. We are nearing the completion of that process, um, and we've been reviewing the site weighting methodology. We had originally intended to um, retrospectively go back and apply the site weighting methodology back to 2012. And in our recent meeting, have um, decided that the current approach would be to better to use unweighted estimates for um, 2012 through 2015. And then we've made some improvements to the way we'll apply the site weighting beginning in 2016. And that will, um, should be finalized by the time we start our season this year. So um, we should be able to provide the recalculated unweighted estimates for 2012 to 2015 to both um, the IPHC and National Marine Fisheries Service here in the next couple of weeks. So glad to hear that. So as um, part of our port sampling efforts for our recreational fisheries, we also, um, our North Coast Management Area, off of Nia Bay is adjacent to um, the Strait of Juan de Fuca and very close to Canada. And we do um, estimate halibut landings into our Nia Bay port throughout the year. Um, not summarized in our report. I'll just say in general, the number of boats and anglers has really dropped significantly. Um, boats from Canada landing into Nia Bay. Um, so, it's dropped steadily since 2011. So for example, in 2011, 880 halibut were um, 
Canadian halibut were landed in Tania Bay, and in 2015 that number had dropped to 434 halibut landed by 648 anglers and about 250 boats. Um, then again, I have a bit more information on the incidental halibut catch in our um, sable fish fishery north of Point Chehalis, Washington. Um, that I can elaborate on what Sarah had said. Um, so the the ratio that was allowed for this year um, was 75 pounds of halibut per 1,000 pounds of stable fish per landing, and that allowed for um, an additional um, two halibut in ex excess of the 75 pounds um, to be landed, um, and and. Speaking to the number of boats, Sarah was right. There were only eight vessels that made 37,000 landings to achieve that, um, that well, 95% of the quota. So the total landings were 9,797 um, pounds net weight compared to the quota of 10,348. And in the last few years, the number of vessels have ranged from 11 to 14, so fewer vessels and uh, somewhat fewer landings to achieve the quota. So I think the anecdotal reports of just more halibut being around is, is reflected in our catch. Um, before I go on to the enforcement report, I can take any questions on this. And um, Commissioner Albertson, if you want me to elaborate on our sampling program, I could do that. Well, I, I think I, we don't need a, a, a lengthy discussion, but I just want them to be aware of the efforts that are being put in by the Washington, Oregon, California. Sure. Right. For our intensive um, sampling program on the coast, that does provide us weekly estimates in season. It allows us to meet once a week with National Marine Fisheries Service and stakeholders, folks from the Halibut Commission, look at where we are in the halibut quota, what our projections are for that following week, really we couldn't do that without the timely estimates from our sampling program that are really focused on um, the halibut fisheries in May. Thank you, Bruce. Um, thank you very much for your report, Heather. I, I was really pleased to see they're making progress in the Puget Sound estimation and I mm -hmm. can you give us a teaser at all on where, where those well our folks at home are, are working on it we had really hoped that we'd be able to to share that with you um, today at this meeting we got an update from them um, just a couple weeks ago and I think it'll just be a couple more weeks before we can okay. um, have those recalculated unweighted estimates at least for that time period that we haven't had so could you uh, if I can, Mr. Chair, could you help me a little bit on, on the reweighting process? Um, have you got any more details on that? <laughs> so what um, I think what, what they did in terms of applying the, the weighting approach that they want to take in 2016 back was there was a one factor that hadn't been collected um, by our samplers that would make the retrospective calculation of a weighted approach to 2015 to 2012 difficult. So the approach in 2016 will, will take that one extra data point that we'll be able to apply from now forward. Um, and, and really the whole, the MRIP recommendations from the, the, the national look at our sampling program was really to say, one, first off, um, how are you sending your samplers out to these different sites and then how do you apply a weighting factor to address that you're not getting absolutely everywhere at once. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions for Heather? Uh, Paul. Yeah, thanks very much, Heather. I was just um, wondering if you could tell us a little, tell me a little bit more about the, the catch monitoring for the recreational fishery. So you have uh, samplers in various locations that are asking questions of, of people when they come into land? That's right. Thank you for the question. Um, so we, um, well, first of all, our samplers are collecting an effort 
they're actually doing a boat count of every boat that leaves the port and returns to the port. So we have a um, daily count of effort. And then the samplers that are at the docks that are meeting the boats as they return maintain a sampling rate um, throughout the day that's consistent. So they're trying to, you know, ensure that their sampling rate isn't real high in the morning when boats returning are small. And so it's it's level to, to try to um, get a steady sampling rate for all boats returning, including peak hours. And I think that sampling rate is about 30%. They're, they're catching every third boat, asking what was caught, measuring halibut, um, the halibut. I think there's almost 100% halibut of the boats that are sampled. All the halibut are, are measured, and that's what's we're using the um, IPHC conversion chart to get the, the weight from our number of fish and our estimates. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anything else? Thank you. So you have some enforcement information. Yep. And I will just run through this really quickly. There's a, a, a really nice report that our enforcement folks did. Um, our um, enforcement patrol, our, our um, doing compliance inspections on the water, on the docks, and in the marketplace. Their enforcement um, efforts focus on the coastal areas, the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Puget Sound, and they're enforcing um, fishing closed season, fishing closed area, possession of endangered species or listed rockfish, illegal gear, unreported and undocumented catch, illegal trafficking and sport caught halibut, and selective gear restrictions. They are um, focusing their efforts on our recreational halibut fisheries, uh, on our recreational salmon fisheries in Washington, Oregon, and California, on commercial ground fish fisheries that are, are not 100% um, halibut, they're looking um, to enforce regulations for wholesale fish dealers and in markets, commercial halibut fisheries, commercial salmon fisheries in Washington, Oregon, and California. And then they um, also have a strong relationship with um, our enforcement officers and our and, and tribal counterparts um, in doing uh, joint patrols in the tribal, commercial, and subsistence halibut fishery. Um, they do a very intensive emphasis patrol during our halibut uh, seasons. So our halibut seasons are three, four days on our north coast. They are really out there in full force. Um, and their report includes a summary of those days that the, the seasons are open. And, and, and you can look at that in detail to see the kind of things that they're um, enforcing. They also have a good interaction with anglers out there um, during that time period. And then just in summary, um, the enforcement patrols for 2015, they, they had 280 officer hours at sea, 52 officer hours in the port. They issued 87 warnings, 39 citations were issued. They made 190 commercial contacts, 1,375 contacts with recreational anglers, nine wholesale dealer inspections, and eight fish processor inspections during their emphasis patrol. So thank you. All those lot. The WDF enforcement officers also work in Oregon and California. Is that, does that say that here? Yeah, I believe so. For and that was specific to salmon. They're doing their um, joint patrols with Oregon and California so, officers. So these numbers you gave us are just numbers in the state of Washington relative to the hell of it in that last table. That's right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate the cooperation amongst the enforcement. That's that's a big deal. So looks like they'll have Oregon fishing.
please go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm Lynn Mattis with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, I want to do take a moment and echo some of what Mr. Anderson said. Uh, we at uh, Oregon really appreciate Dr. Lehman and all the time and effort you've put in and uh, working with us through our processes. And me personally, I've appreciated working with you for the last 15, 16 years. So thank you. Um, we do have a, a report on the recreational and commercial fisheries in Oregon, and we provided some economic information as well. Uh, the last several years, we've provided a fairly lengthy economic report. We did not do the whole thing this year, but we put a link to last year's report um, in, the, in this report, so if you want to take a look at the, how, um, all the methodology, it's in there. Um, this is just to help give an idea, show an idea that while the poundage that's involved in the big grand scheme of things may not seem like much, that small amount of poundage does have a big impact to Oregon uh, coastal economies. Um, as far as our uh, recreational fisheries in Oregon, uh, we have three areas, the Columbia River sub-area that uh, Ms. Reed mentioned, our central coast sub-area, which is the majority of Oregon, and then we have the southern Oregon sub-area, which is the two far southern ports of uh, Gold Beach and Brookings. Uh, I think Ms. Reed covered the Columbia River area pretty well. Um, anecdotally, what, we, what I did hear from folks up there on our side of the river was the weather was just really great in May, and it allowed a lot more people out to get out and fish in May than they normally would, and the halibut were there. Um, in regards to our uh, Central Coast sub-area, that fishery is broken up into three. That area is broken up into three fisheries, a nearshore or inside 40-fathom fishery, a spring all-depth, and a summer all-depth. Uh, for the second year in a row, the nearshore fishery opened July 1st instead of May 1st. Uh, the fishery proceeded a little slowly to begin with, and then it did take off in August and September. Uh, we might have had we were going to hit the quota in late September, but working with nymphs and IPHC staff, realized there was quota from a couple of other sub areas that probably weren't going to be taken, and we could keep we could keep it open through the regulatory closure and still not exceed the entire quota. Um, the previous year. The quota had been left uh, unharvested out of that area. Um, folks just hadn't dialed in yet where to find the halibut in July like they had in May and June. Um, our spring all-depth fishery this season is set up pre-season. Uh, we have meetings to determine the number of fixed dates and then backup dates. The fixed dates are days that are guaranteed to be open unless the entire spring and summer uh, all-depth quotas are taken. Uh, and then we de designate backup days if there's any quota left over. Uh, this year, that almost became an issue. The weather was so good this spring, and in May, uh, our first two fixed openings were the two best spring openings since 2000. Or spring, yeah, spring openings since 2002. And the, we had 12 fixed days scheduled, and after six of them we had taken approximately 80% of the spring quota. And uh, there was a lot of nervous people that we were getting up all of the summer all depth quota as well as the near shore. Um, whether the, the next two sets of three all depth days, the weather didn't cooperate as much, and uh, we, we made it through the spring fixed dates, but there wasn't enough quota left over for any uh, additional backup days. We did move what little bit of quota was left to the summer all-depth. Uh, the last several years, the summer all-depth fishery, which opens the first Friday in August, has been the busiest fishing weekend on the Oregon coast. Out of Newport alone, we can have 400 boats cross the bar on a single day. Uh, this year, the weather, was, it was good, but it wasn't perfect. Um, so we didn't quite have that effort, that first, that first opening and people have kind of gotten used to there only being one or two openings. Uh, the weather wasn't so good on the second either, and then we ended up having quota on the summer all depth that uh, extended all the way through to the regulatory closure. Um, in Oregon, once you get about a week past Labor Day, most people do switch over and start hunting. So there wasn't a whole lot of effort that still that was happening. And with that, Knowing there was still some quota there, that's where we got some of it to keep the near shore open. It allowed both, both of those to be open for the entire time period until October 
for 31st without going over the allocation. Then our last area is the Southern Oregon sub-area. These are the two far southern towns on the Oregon coast. Um, the last, uh, starting in 2011, a fishery had kind of exploded down there, and we adjusted some quota to get uh, a fishery a little bit more. We only had about 3,000 pounds down there last uh, in 2014. 2015, we had 73.18, and the they normally have a pulse in May and then a pulse in August when salmon slows down. The, the pulse of fishing and, and uh, catch in May did not happen this year. Talking to anglers down there, it was a combination of tides, and there were several shrimp boats fishing right in those same areas, and uh, they thought the shrimp boats had maybe stirred up the waters a little too much. There was a pulse in August when salmon slowed down, but it wasn't what we had seen the last couple of years, and some allocation was left there. There is a table on... Let's see, on page four, table one, has the number of halibut sampled, average weight, total number of halibut harvested, and total pounds for each of our sub-areas and for the or entire Oregon coast. Um, the Columbia River sub-area is only poundage into Oregon. Um, so this year, the our samplers physically touched 4,164 halibut over the course of the year out of an estimated 10,264 total landed for a sampling percentage of 41%. Um, our sampling goal is approximately 25% because the goals for our ORBS program, our backside sampling program, are based on what's needed for salmon returns. So anything above that 25% is a bonus. Um, and I think with that, I'll stop with the summary of the fisheries if there's any questions before going on to the enforcement report. Thank you very much, Lynn. Are there any questions? So is it a, are the recreational fisheries subject to a two fish a day angler limit? Is there a possession limit? Uh, Chair Balsinger, uh, in Oregon, there is a one fish daily bag limit. Uh, in all of our sport fisheries and a six fish total uh, annual limit. And anglers, in addition to having a regular sport fishing license, also have to purchase what's com called a combined angling tag. And this is for salmon, sturgeon, steelhead, and halibut. Thank you very much. Paul, please. Um, what does that license cost in Oregon? Uh, Vice Chair Ryle, I believe last year it was $26, but I know we had a fee increase this year. Um, I'm not positive what it was. I, I believe with my, as a state resident, it was $65 total for my fishing license and my combined angling license last year. I'm interested in the, the tag, um, and I see somewhere here that the tag has to be validated. What do those tags look like? Where are they purchased and how are they validated and do they need to be attached to the fish and that sort of thing? Uh, Commissioner Boys, I, I think you've jumped ahead a little bit to the enforcement report, but uh, when uh, the, the combined angling tag and the fishing license in Oregon comes off of a spool, it almost looks like a cash register receipt, but it's on a durable waterproof paper with indelible ink, and there's a little spreadsheet in that that has spot slots for six halibut, and I don't remember how many salmon and steelhead, and the angler immediately upon landing is to fill out the date, the size, and the location of where that halibut was uh, taken. Um, and as you can see in the enforcement report, a lot of the, uh, the non-compliance issues they have is people not validating. Okay. Yes, it is. There, the Oregon State Police uh, provided a summary. Uh, lieutenant Schwartz, who's their fisheries lieutenant, asked if I could uh, provide you some information for you. Um, one thing they did want me to mention that's not in the report is in 2015, the 
Oregon State Police troopers on the coastal counties, uh, there was a new marine fisheries team created. Now, this is seven, dedicated, seven troopers who are primarily dedicated to marine fisheries enforcement um, out of our coastal fish and wildlife troopers. Um, and the plan, the thought is it's to provide more consistent enforcement throughout the coast. So you know you're talking to the same seven enforcement officers and it allows them some more dedicated scheduling uh, and I, hopefully it's going to work out well for them. Um, the front of this report has a picture of the Guardian, which is a boat that the Oregon State Police purchased a few years ago. Uh, it's a retired charter vessel and this does allow the the troopers to get a little more offshore and do some more offshore patrols than they previously had been able to do. On page three of the document, there is some summary activities about uh, their, their um, enforcement. Um, in 2015, and as far as Halibut goes, they contacted 585 anglers. 43 were not in compliance. The majority of those were failure to uh, validate tag or incursions into the Stonewall Bank Yellowy Rockfish Conservation Area. Um, but that led to a 93% compliance rate. Um, there's some information about the hours worked. Um, total out Oregon State Police hours worked towards halibut last year was just under 600. Um, and with that, I'll probably just try to answer any questions I can. So I like the, the, the vessel. Is that like 36 feet or something like that? Uh, Chair Balsinger, I believe it's a little bigger than that. I, I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's 50, but I'm not sure how, how big it is. Thank you very much. Any questions? I see no, Thank you very much for a good report. When you're ready, please. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Marcy Aramco, and I'm a Fisheries Program Manager with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is the second year that California has sent representatives to your annual meeting, and we're excited to be here with our other co-managers from Area 2A. The California coastline plays a unique part in Pacific halibut management throughout its history as it's located as the, at the southern extent of the population range and historically has been a, a minor and irregular contributor to the fishery compared with other management areas. But uh, catch and or catch rates have been steadily increasing in California since about 2008. So uh, you might remember last year we brought you up to date on some changes to the catch sharing plan to uh, establish a new uh, allocation for California individually and separate from Oregon. Um, beginning in 2014, um, we set California sport aside as its own box, which you can see up there in, in purple on the bottom, um, so that we would have a separate sub area and allocation. Then after lots of compromise and discussion and work by the area to a non-tribal interests in the council arena to figure out how to area or how area two a would be able to support a new and growing California fishery, uh, the council um, modified the catch sharing plan so that California would receive three additional percent of that area two a non-tribal share beginning in 2015. Uh, the contribution came uh, with 1% from uh, each of the Washington and Oregon sport fisheries and 1% from the commercial fishery. So those other boxes in the, in the second column there um, uh, each contributed 1%. So in turn, uh, for this kind of uh, adjustment to the California allocation, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife committed to in-season monitoring and tracking of catch against the corresponding California quota, which was 25,220 pounds in 2015. You've heard uh, already during this meeting from your uh, staff uh, in reports this week that 2015 marks the first year that we've done uh, in-season management real-time uh, and quota tracking as part of the Area 2 ACSP. 
and we're happy to report that this management approach was very successful in 2015 and we plan to continue with it in 2016 and beyond. Um, the California season was scheduled to be open the first half of each month in May, June, July, and August, and then full months to be open in September and October. And that season structure was developed with significant public input that really uh, was interested in seeing some amount of fishing opportunity throughout the open six-month season. However, based on high projected catches that our department produced weekly uh, and some good weather during the open days of the summer months, uh, following discussions with members of your staff as well as NIMS, uh, an in-season fishery closure was implemented on August 13th. So we were not able to offer any opportunities in the, the later part of the season based on that projected early attainment of the 2015 quota. Uh, regarding the methods, uh, the methods we use to monitor and track and project the attainment of the quota are detailed in our report and include kind of a basic description of our California Recreational Fisheries Survey, which is a comprehensive California creel census program that's used throughout the state to estimate recreational catch of salmon, ground fish, highly migratory species including tunas and other species of fish, fin fish as well as California halibut which we also have further to the south. The program is designed to provide 20% coverage of all major fish, recreational fishing activity at the primary launch ramp sites as well as the charter boats. Uh, so just wanted to call out a few uh, items in our report specifically. Um, table 1 on page 6, the majority of the catch occurred in the open periods during July and August, the summer months. In keeping with recent trends, Trinidad Harbor was the location where the greatest number of the fish were seen. And that's shown on figure 1 on page 7. And our final catch estimate in 2015 is 24,906 pounds, which is 99% of that 25,220 pound quota. So uh, the method worked very well. Uh, our department would like to acknowledge the very hard work that the California recreational industry played uh, this year in working with us and their membership to comply with the in-season closure. This is new territory for all of us and we uh, really appreciate their assistance in getting the word out and making sure that uh, when we were done, we were done. Um, both the Creel Census folks as well as our law enforcement agents report that there was uh, full compliance with the closure. There were no fish observed after the, the closure was enacted. You can read more about this and have a look at a few of the pictures of the closure and the, the steps taken uh, on pages 10 through 14 of our report. And I'd also like to draw your attention to figure 6 on page 16. The California quota amount each year is the gray bars and the estimated catch is uh, depicted in green bars. And the number of open days each year is shown by the black line. The California fishery lasted 57 days this year, which is down significantly from the 153 days that it was open in 2014. Then moving on to figure 7 on the next page, the average catch per day increased dramatically in 2015 to over 400 pounds per day which is inversely related to the number of open fishing days. So this rather abrupt increase in the average uh, daily estimated catch may be an indication that the halibut fishery off California is transitioning to a derby style fishery, much like many other areas of Oregon and Washington's recreational fisheries. And it indicates, and also, um, even with the increased effort that we're seeing on the open days, there doesn't seem to be any shortage of halibut available. And uh, table four on page eight uh, shows that the catch rates witnessed during one week in July of 2015 
were the highest on record in California, possibly suggesting that our fishery is still developing and the stock lo stock's local availability, uh, availability is increasing uh, and or anglers are just getting better at catching them. And I guess jumping to the enforcement report, um, we're new members to the West Coast Enforcement Team uh, based on action taken by you uh, last year to commission our officers. And in 2015, we dedicated a total of 175 operational hours to halibut enforcement. And this information, I should mention, is contained in the NIMS West Coast Enforcement Report. We didn't submit a separate state report, so uh, it's available there on pages 5 and 6 in that NIMS report. Um, we performed enforcement and compliance dockside and at-sea patrols on the Pacific North Coast out of uh, Mendocino, Humboldt, and Del Norte counties. We uh, conducted checks on angler bag limits, at sea patrols, um, looking at uh, gear, looking at uh, closed seasons, and um, I guess we spent 70 hours at sea, 35 uh, at sea personnel hours, and then 35 uh, near shore vessel hours, so the smaller boats working the coast. And um, we accomplished 285 contacts specific for Pacific Halibut. And in those 285 contacts, uh, no prohibited activities were noted during those patrols. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So did uh, you catch that fisher holding up there in the last page? <laughs> yes. Yes, I did. Congratulations. Not the big one. Any questions for Marcy? Bob? So, Marcy, I, I'm looking at this figure seven that you, you uh, went through with us and then the figure six also. I'm, I'm just wondering, California has had a very warm water with the El Nino and La Nina. Any speculation on that having an impact on any of this? Uh, your catch rates or anything like that, or is it just well, speculation? We, I, it's hard to speculate, but we have seen a continued increasing trend in productivity. So. Um, the warm water doesn't appear to be scaring the fish back north. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Please, please. If there, are, if there are questions, Commissioner, I'll wait. I, I didn't see. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Please. Yeah, I missed what you said, Marcy, about <clears throat> how many days it was open in 2015. It was 153 and 14, and and 57. Thank you. And 15. <clears throat> Just a, a couple of comments. One is uh, I wanted to thank you very much, Marcy, for the report. It's very thorough. You've got a lot of information in here. And I want to make a general comment about all the folks um, from Washington and California and managing the halibut fisheries here. This is all in-season management, and I think you guys do really a fantastic job with this about trying to keep track of all the fish that are being caught. And I know it's a big sampling program for both the agencies. And uh, just speaking on behalf of the staff, we really appreciate the fact that you folks are taking this very seriously. You do a really terrific job in some of this. So, so thanks very much. Thank you. Any final questions? Thanks very much. Good report. Let's see, we've gone north to south. Do we have a Coast Guard report? I have all these reports online, but my computer is so slow going back and forth, I can't see who's next. And <laughs> so that's why I'm asking, but thank you. So this is 12.5.1, I believe. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Um, so my name is Chris Barrows. I'm a commander in the U.S. Coast Guard here from uh, the 17th District in Juneau, Alaska, and I've been asked uh, by my colleagues uh, in uh, 
D11 and uh, D13 uh, to provide uh, the Coast Guard presentation, enforcement presentation uh, to you. Um, and I'm here with uh, my counterpart from the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement. My name is Bill Giles. I'm the Assistant Director in Charge of the West Coast Division for the Office of Law Enforcement. And we did this last year. We come up and present our reports together because we work together as a team. We're very, uh, we have to work very closely with all our partners due to resource limitations, and we're all working toward the same mission. Uh, so with that, um, I'll get right into it uh, from the federal standpoint. Uh, this is a representation of the effort that the U.S. Coast Guard was able to apply uh, in 2015, uh, totaling uh, 64 boardings at sea in 2015, and it uh, provides a bit of a comparison to our efforts in Area 2A uh, for the last, uh, or, or in comparison to 2014 as well. Um, and uh, digging a little deeper into those numbers, uh, here is a representation or, or the numbers associated with our effort in comparison to the commercial of, uh, efforts and then the recreational and subsistence efforts that we also assisted with. And uh, to continue along the theme, this is, was done in, in, in concert both with uh, NOAA Office of Law Enforcement but also with, uh, uh, in coordination with some of our state partners which you just heard from. Um, so we did not see any or observe any uh, violations of uh, halibut regulations uh, in the recreational and subsistence fleets uh, from a U.S. Coast Guard perspective, but we did have uh, uh, seven commercial uh, violations that we identified. Um, and so this next slide, I believe, goes into more detail about those. Oh, no, it's just a representation of basically what I just told you. So let me slip on to the next one, which goes about uh, uh, the type of violations that we, that we identified. Um, there were uh, 11 undersized halibut that were seized from one vessel. Uh, the operator of one vessel was cited for not having an IPHC permit on board. And then we had another vessel that uh, had gear in the water following the closure of a derby. And that one was a little bit um, uh, interesting because uh, uh, that vessel uh, actually had asked for some assistance and in the course of rendering assistance to that vessel, the Coast Guard found out that uh, he was woefully unprepared in terms of the safety requirements that he was supposed to have. And so we ended up terminating his voyage, uh, which had the additional repercussions of him uh, not being able to take his gear out of the water, uh, which then steamrolled into another fishing vessel that uh, uh, went out to collect his gear, but not till two weeks later, and they didn't let us know. So the, uh, it's a little bit of a drama saga, but uh, we ended up... Um, uh, trying to suss out the details of that, and we forward that on to uh, NOAA OLE to further investigate, and uh, maybe you'll have some additional words to say if you'd like about, about that one. So I don't have any additional comments at this point on that part, but I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, our enforcement resources that we have and the importance that we have to work together with our partners with the Coast Guard and the three states, Oregon, Washington and California, and how important that par partnership is. <clears throat> Currently, uh, the Office of Law Enforcement has been under a hiring freeze for agents for about five years. My workforce is about 40% of what it was five years ago. I've been able to hire a couple of officers that are not frozen, and we're staffing up with enforcement officers. However, last year I hired two officers, but that was offset by retirements, promotions, and transfers out of the district, so we, didn't, we had a net loss of personnel in the district again. However, the Office of Law Enforcement has been able to appoint a new director in September. Uh, that position was vacant for a year and a half. That new director comes to us from General Counsel for Enforcement. He was the leader over there. He's... Uh, comes to us with a lot of experience. He was an FBI uh, advisor, attorney advisor for the FBI for 15 years, and prior to that he's a Marine officer. He's only been with us since September, but since that time we were very impressed with what he brings for us. And in December we were able to fill the deputy director's position permanently, and that's with uh, Logan Gregory. He is the assistant director, my counterpart out of the New England area. So he's going to handle operations and um, Jim Landon, 
our new director is going to lead the agency and we've got a lot of high hopes there. And just in the past two weeks, I've been able to hire uh, two supervisory enforcement officers, one that started on Monday and one that started two weeks ago Monday. They're both going off to training, but we look forward to having them back. And I think this year that we're going to be able to start hiring folks and be able to put folks back on the street and doing these investigations, particularly with the president's um, in, excuse me, the president's initiatives, the one on uh, international unregulated and unreported fishing. They're going to provide us with additional 15 agents above our cap. Also with the president's initiative on wildlife trafficking, both those require the skill sets of special agents. And in my report here, I wanted to highlight a little bit about the joint enforcement agreement, the cooperative enforcement program that we have, which is the overriding program for the joint enforcement agreements that we have with our three states. And uh, if I can direct your attention to um, page six of our report, that uh, CDF and W uh, committed eight commission staff toward halibut enforcement activities for a total of 175 hours. We've heard that already. These are directed operations. These where we get to sit down with the Coast Guard and our state partners when we have um, halibut fishery openers coming, whether it's the Derby or whether it's the uh, All Depth or one of the reopeners. We'll sit down with our partners to make sure that we have a plan so we can utilize our limited resources to the best abilities that we have. We have special agents to do the investigations. We have the Coast Guard to do the at-sea patrols. We have uh, some vessel capabilities from the states, particularly Oregon now with their new Guardian vessel to go out further out offshore to do some of those patrols with us. And when they develop those cases, as uh, Commander Barrow was pointing out, they get referred to our agents for further investigation. So those kind of uh, uh, partnerships and cooperations are very important. The, uh, on page seven is the Oregon, you know, they commissioned 15 or they uh, committed 15 commission staff toward the halibut enforcement. And those dollar numbers there are the dollars that we provide to the uh, states for that kind of work to help them with their limited resources. Oregon has the new Guardian vessel through the JEA program. We provided a majority of the funding for that vessel, and that now gives them the ability to reach offshore a little bit further and conduct better patrols. Under uh, Washington, which is on page nine, I think that's, oops, I'm sorry, on page 11, they committed 16 commission staff. Now let's augment the folks we already have out there. And again, this is all for directed enforcement operations where we sit down and plan these operations and divide up the responsibilities so we don't duplicate our efforts, but we cover the best area that we can. And uh, with Washington, we're currently right now in the process of providing them funding for them to buy and acquire a bigger vessel to give them uh, a bigger reach too and to replace a, a vessel that's getting pretty tired. And I think this all boils down to the bottom line is the, uh, the compliance rate, the number of officers and agents that are out on the water that are doing the halibut enforcement. Uh, the compliance rate, Oregon, 93%, California at least discovered 100% for their for the directed enforcement operations, approximately 90% 90, 90 for Washington, I don't have the exact figure. I think that's pretty high compliance rates for the effort that's out on the water. I think it's nearly the same as what the Coast Guard discovered out there. Theirs might have been a little bit higher. Um, but I think our efforts are well, well worth it. I think it uh, helps out the fishery and uh, this commission here. So I can confirm uh, from an at-sea observation uh, perspective, our, our compliance rates that we detect are, are right around the 90% mark as well, uh, which is consistent uh, um, as uh, my colleague just mentioned. So with that, I think we'll open it up to any questions that you might have for us. Thank you, Commander. So uh, could I get the, your title? Did we yeah, used to have a SAC in the area? Or are we used to have special agents in charge. Last year, uh, the folks back in D.C., 
Silver Spring made the decision to change our titles to assistant directors. So you would have been the SAC two years ago? I was, yes. Thank you. I thought you were, and that's why I was wondering if you took a step down now that you're assistant director. So thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, the assistant Good. directors, it, you know, I think it's probably at the same level. I see that. It's just uh, realignment of titles in the office. Got it. Thank you. Any questions of these gentlemen? I'd just like to, to thank the 13th and the 17th for the work they do pulling guys off, uh, injured people off the boats, and I think a couple weeks ago, the 13th pulled a couple of people out of Nia Bay area, uh, maybe three actually. So thank you very much. That's kind of rescue. I just want to make one last comment. I want to thank Dr. Lehman for his leadership. Very much appreciated, and I wish him well with his future endeavors. Bruce, do we have another two-way report? Mm -hmm. I think you're right. So we have a. Uh, we we'll move into the two B reports. Uh, it's a little bit early, but why don't we take a 10-minute break till 3 o'clock, and then we'll try to get through the 2B reports this afternoon. I think maybe 15 minutes is more uh, reasonable, so let's try 3.05. So I wasn't impatient, uh, and, and looking at the list, we have three reports from Area 2B, uh, which would complete our day's work today. And it's, uh, tomorrow morning we start with the Amendment 80 report, uh, and, and so I don't, I don't think we'll jump ahead in the schedule. So we have lots of time. And if you'd like a little more break right now, that'd be fine. Otherwise, we can finish this up and see where we get to. No, I think we should uh, carry on, Jim. That would be okay. good. Yeah. Thank you. So in that case, let's do. Uh, the 2B reports, starting with whatever you would like. Good afternoon. My name is Adam Kaiser. I'm the halibut and sable fish coordinator with the ground fish management unit of Fisheries and Oceans Canada in Vancouver. I'll start with good news that I think all of the 2B reports will be pretty brief, so be done early. Um, the, the reports that have been provided, I believe, are on your uh, computers there. I'll go through some of the highlights for the annual report. Uh, Will Davis will provide a summary of the recreational catch report, and Ann Bussell will give uh, some comments on enforcement. Um, so within Area 2B, we have the, the Canadian total allowable catch. This is composed of the catch limit that's negotiated each year at the annual meeting, as well as amounts set aside for, for food, social, and ceremonial uh, harvest. That's uh, going to personal and subsistence that we see in, in the catch tables. Uh, and then there's also carryover adjustments. That's the overage and underage allowances in the commercial groundfish fisheries. Uh, in 2015, the Canadian TAC was 7.44 million pounds. Table 1, near the end of the annual report submitted by DO, describes how the, um, uh, 
TAC is, is split up amongst the, uh, the different users. Uh, so the, it's the commercial and recreational TAC or a catch limit that is the, the FCEY that we discuss each year at the annual meeting. Um, now this year the commercial FCEY was, uh, or the, sorry, the commercial uh, TAC was reduced by 76,000 pounds owing to an overage from the previous season. Uh, again, this is outlined all within Table 1. One item I will draw your attention to is Table 1 uh, commercial allocation calculations are missing a line item. So if you did the math uh, starting with the 7.3 million pounds, it wouldn't equal the 5.8 million pounds. So you're missing a, a 60,000 pound amount of fish that's set aside for something we've called use of fish. This is where a, a group of stakeholders have collectively agreed to set aside part of the catch limit for research purposes. So most of that 60,000 pounds was uh, set aside to account for mortality on a long line rockfish survey. Uh, <clears throat> so the details of the, the splits are identified within the table. For the commercial harvest in area 2B, the total allowable catch in 2015 was 5.8 million pounds. Now you'll recall uh, we're in our 10th year of, or 9th year of ground fish integration. That's where all commercial ground fish harvesters, excluding ground fish trawl, are permitted to fish for and retain halibut. To do so, they need to acquire individual transferable quotas. They're also subject to 100% at sea and dockside monitoring. Uh, so when you see the total commercial uh, ground fish mortality of 5.75 million pounds, that accounts for all non-trawl commercial ground fish mortality. So that's halibut that's landed on directed rockfish trips. That's halibut that may be discarded by black cod trips during the halibut close time, et cetera. Uh, for the recreational fisheries, the uh, available harvest that was provided to uh, the 2B harvesters was 1.06 million pounds, and they landed 0.984 million pounds. As I mentioned earlier, Neil Davis will provide some more detail about the recreational catch estimates. Um, one recreational component that I will speak to is the ongoing experimental recreational fishery. Uh, this is, I believe it's its fifth year. Uh, it's a program that examines alternative catch monitoring tools and the use of a market-based transfer mechanism to provide additional harvest opportunity to recreational harvesters. Essentially what it means is if you'd like to fish for and retain halibut in excess of the size limits, possession limits, or daily limits in the recreational fishery, you can acquire a commercial quota and do so. In 2015, uh, approximately uh, 8,600 pounds of quota was acquired and just over 5,000 pounds of catch was landed. Um, one other point, which isn't discussed in detail in the report, but it was raised uh, yesterday in Heather Gilroy's presentation, was a discussion about bycatch in Area 2B. Uh, you'll note that the estimated bycatch in Area 2B by the groundfish trawl fishery was uh, just under 340,000 pounds. That is an increase over the past few years. I think the 20-year average is about uh, 250,000, or in that range, 225,000 pounds. Um, there is some anecdotal information about uh, changing market conditions, of uh, changed fishing practices, in particular an increase in the arrowtooth flounder fishery in Area 2B that may be responsible for some of the changes in bycatch. The number for 2015, while it is an increase, isn't completely out of line with uh, historical periods of when arrowtooth flounder was, uh, was also a desirable fish. I think uh, 20, 2005, 6, and 7 all had by catch amounts that were uh, close to, to this year's estimate. Um, this has been a discussion item at some of our advisory boards. Uh, domestic stakeholders have raised this as a concern, so we've committed to some uh, ongoing discussions into the new year. So that's the, uh, that's the highlight for, for Area 2B commercial fishery. I'd um, be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Would, would you say your name again first? Adam Kaiser. Adam Kaiser. I sort of know you, but I didn't hear what you said. So of course, thanks for repeating. <laughs> thanks. Are there any questions for Adam? So, I, I, oh, Bob, please. <laughs> so um, maybe I'm reading the numbers wrong, but uh, the uh, the total amount approved for last year in 2B was 7.04. Uh, 
And I'm looking at a um, table two, I guess. Is it table two? Um, no, it's, it's uh, table one, of the, and at the bottom it says 2B commercial and recreational catch 6.7. So am I missing 400,000 pounds, or, or was, it, was it not caught? Was it left on the table? There was uh, some catch left, or some available catch left in the water, uh, but also there's there's a number of adjustments that are done to the catch limit. Um, in particular, there's about 79,000 pounds of overage from a previous year, so catch in excess of the limits that was produced from the uh, allocations to the commercial fleet. There's also uh, 60,000 pounds that was set aside for use of fish, and then some other adjustments for uh, treaty or final agreements. More questions? So, so uh, on the XRQ, then, mm -hmm. there potentially could be 3,000 pounds carried over next year. Because is that right? Can it carry from year to year? Or does it have to, I know it said that it has to be put into some account by some date, but it looked to me like that could be re-upped again the next year. Mm -hmm. So um, as a heuristic approach, it's probably safe to say that about 3,000 pounds would be carried over. The carryover restrictions are actually applied on an individual license basis. So the, the rules that are in place right now allow um, 200 pounds or 10% of the total quota on the license, whatever is greater. Most folks have the minimum quota on the license of 20 pounds, so I would anticipate that that would all be carried forward. Thank you very much. Bruce. Just a question, Adam. Is that um, how long can that be carried forward? Right now, there's no termination on a carryover amount. It's similar to the carryover provisions that exist in the commercial ground fish fishery. Um, as, as part of the experimental fishery, though, we continue to examine whether or not it's a problem. Like, we don't want to see this as a you know, pool of quota that's continually right. growing. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Interesting report. I like, I like the XRQ idea. If I could add uh, one more thing, it's just to, to say good luck and thanks very much to Bruce. And uh, I, I haven't been around that long, but in my nine years as a fishery manager, you've always been uh, very generous with your time and knowledge. And it's been uh, very helpful in my experience here. So thank you. So the to be sport catch. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Davis. I'm the regional manager for ground fish fisheries with DFO in Vancouver. Um, I'm pinch hitting on this one. So um, the benefit may be that <clears throat> I'll be especially brief. Uh, so I'm going to provide a bit of an overview of the um, recreational fishery. So hopefully you have that report in front of you. I'll take you to start uh, to page three with the summary. Um, so just to refresh your memories, the recreational allocation in 2015 was just over a million, uh, 60,000 pounds or so. Uh, our catch, uh, landed catch, was about 984,000 pounds. <clears throat> so we were under by approximately 80,000 pounds. Um, one interesting note in terms of how this compares to recent years is that um, there were a decreasing number of pieces but an increasing poundage. So we're seeing a slight change in the size, average size or weight of the fish that are landed within the recreational fishery over the last three years. Part of this is explained by some management changes uh, that occurred in 2014 uh, where size limits were increased, but um, even comparing 15 to 14, the size of, or the weight of the fish in 2015 was slightly larger. Um, a couple other notes from the fishery uh, worth mentioning. Uh, we do a bunch of uh, biological sampling, which you'll see on page four, table two. They come from a variety of sources, and I'll speak about that in a minute. But you see, in total, we, we gather about 17 or 18,000 samples um, that inform our estimates of average weight for different areas of the coast and so on. Um, in terms of monitoring programs that, uh, that support uh, the estimate of, of catch numbers for this fishery and the samples, we have basically two main sources um, of reporting or, or, or information for the fishery. The first is our creel surveys, 
uh, where we have monitors at the dock that basically sort of document and sample the fish that are coming in at popular landing sites up and down the coast. And then for a number of areas of the coast, because there are hundreds of different sites that are fairly remote uh, up and down the BC coast, uh, there are um, uh, a number of locations where uh, the department relies on log books that are submitted by lodges, which in many cases for some of these more remote areas are the, um, the bulk of the catch coming out of those areas as far as we are aware. Those programs Programs in 2015 were by and large consistent uh, with the way they had been implemented in recent years previous, so no major changes in that respect. Um, and I think Adams covered uh, some of the outcomes from the XRQ fishery. Um, management measures that were in place for the fishery this year were, as I mentioned, they were the same as 2014, so that consisted of a few different things. The first was a maximum size limit. Uh, the second was um, that one of the two fish permitted to be in your possession had to be smaller than um, 90 centimeters, which was below the maximum size limit of 133 centimeters. You also had an annual limit of six halibut that you could retain over the course of the fishing season. And um, you had a daily limit of one. A couple things that are a bit newer, although not new to this year, they are still recent, um, are also uh, with this imp implementation of an annual limit, it, there's a requirement to record the halibut you catch on your license so that that can be essentially sort of audited by a fishery officer at any point in time. And uh, there's also been a new um, requirement for mandatory uh, submission of catch information when requested by a fishery officer or a representative of the department. And that's both to support our existing programs, but also as a nice segue into some of the things that we are now on the cusp of implementing with respect to new monitoring and reporting tools for the coming year. So um, what we intend to do in 2016 is introduce uh, an internet survey as a means of gathering catch information out of the recreational fishery. This has been implemented on a pilot basis for I think three years now. It's, uh, it goes out to a sample of license holders and uh, they're required to submit their catch information for a particular month over the uh, of the fishing season and and the intention is that um, this will do a few things uh, it will be implemented for every year or every month of the year and that will give us information um, particular to the halibut fish, fishery for a number of months and areas where we currently don't have uh, catch information being submitted so this is going to fill some of the gaps we have in the generation of, a, of an estimate for this fishery so um, Following on the three years of piloting this, uh, the kind of methods behind this were drafted into some um, reports that went through a peer review science process uh, last fall. The, uh, the methods were approved through that peer review process, so we feel like we now have the green light to start implementing it for use in management of our fisheries in future years. Uh, so for the coming year, our intention is to uh, use this internet survey which goes by an acronym IREC uh, to fill in the gaps where we don't have some of our uh, where we don't have traditional catch monitoring programs uh, providing us with catch information to generate a more complete estimate of recreational catch uh, for the future uh, including 2016. So exactly how that looks and how it's going to combine with our traditional programs we're just in the midst of kind of putting together, I would say, the final details of that approach through consultation with our recreational fishery advisory bodies. Um, and we intend to have that in place in time for the opening of the season in 2016. So I think I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Bruce? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Neil, I was looking at table two here. Yeah. Um, and this is looking at the biological samples from there. Am I right in assuming that the, the ones that are listed as logbook are self-reported by the logbook? Correct. Okay. And I'm a little confused by the total, grand total down at the bottom. Uh, if you look at the coastwide 
above that, it seems to be considerably more than 17,000. Yeah, you're right. I'll have to go back and check this. One of the, I guess, um, limitations is uh, having not written this report, I'll, I would have to go find out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it looks like there's a mistake in the yeah. math okay. here, so I'll double check that. Thanks, right. please. Just to, to, to comment on that, so of this total, which is something like 20,000 roughly, about 16,000 of that is self-reported. Yeah, it, it is, although I should also mention that um, we do send either Creel monitors or DFO staff to some of these lodges, and they audit some of the logbook entries, so they attend at certain points throughout the season, particularly in the busiest times when most of, the, most of the catch is being landed, to sort of verify some of this information. So while I would still say that the vast majority of, of the logbook information is self-reported, there is some auditing of what that uh, information is throughout the year. Thank you. And I guess that's one of those, what I was getting to was that have you done a comparison between those validated numbers and what the uh, Creel sampling is showing you in terms of length composition? Uh, I don't know offhand. Yeah. Um, it would be worthwhile, I think, taking a look at that. Yeah, I think it's something I can follow up on and get back to you with. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? So, so Neil, uh, I don't know if you'll know this either, but where does Nia Bay fish show up? The, fi the Canadian fish that gets landed in Nia Bay, who's, where is that? So <clears throat> my understanding is that... Um, Part of our Creole program includes overflights, and so what happens is we get Creole estimates from certain points and days, and then we use overflights to generate estimates of fishing effort that we then apply to the catch information from days that have been Creoled to expand that estimate for a particular month and area. The overflights include the um, the fishing effort that occurs within areas that may be uh, fished out of Nia Bay but within Canadian waters. So that effort is captured and it would, we would be using the, um, we would just happen to be using the ports that are on the Canadian side as this, the, the basis of the catch estimate from which to expand that with the effort. But the effort itself will include the, uh, the Nia Bay portion of it. Thank you very much. I think I ask that about every other year. I can't keep you know, I, I ask it of our technical staff every <laughs> other year myself. So, Thank you. Anything else? I see nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job from the groundfish perspective. And I think we're looking for the enforcement report. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ann Bussell. I'm a federal fishery officer currently working with our acting ground fish enforcement coordinator, Maya Cormie, who was unable to attend. She uh, did the report, enforcement report for 2015, and I will summarize for you what uh, occurred during that time. Uh, so I apologize my voice, I'm just recovering from a cold. It might give out on me, I'll do my best. Um, <clears throat> the, so the, our, the enforcement group is part of our uh, conservation and protection sector and we're responsible, responsible for enforcing the acts and regs. Uh, there's approximately 160 fishery officers in the Pacific region, which includes the Yukon and the province of British Columbia. And those two areas are divided, are, they are divided into four areas, um, BC Interior and the Yukon is one, North Coast, South Coast and Lower Fraser. Um, the majority of fishery officers are stationed along the Pacific Coast and uh, in various, uh, some remote offices and some larger urban offices. Currently, uh, the conservation and protection sector is undergoing quite significant change. Uh, uh, we are attempting to modernize and to redirect our efforts through uh, some new programs and some existing ones. So I'll, I'll just go over a bit of the new changes. Um, thanks very much. In 2015, we uh, have two large Coast Guard vessels now 
dedicated to enforcement activities. One does the North Coast Patrol and the other the South Coast Patrol. They're approximately 43 meters in length and they do 22 patrols per year per vessel which amounts to approximately 286 to 309 operational days. On each patrol there will be from two to three fishery officers and then the Coast Guard crew that runs the ships. Um, so there's 14 fishery officers uh, involved um, and spread between those two vessels. Another program that's just under getting underway is our National Fisheries Intelligence Service. <clears throat> They've hired the chief of the rest, Western Region and an, there's an acting supervisor. One analyst has been hired and one area in, intel officer. We hope to have five intel officers total for the four areas in the Pacific region and then one based in Alberta in Edmonton. Um, and there will be five analysts, so one analyst per intel officer. The idea is to help redirect our resources and our officers to address the most significant non-compliance in our region. Um, and this might involve some quite complex investigations. So we're hoping to increase our expertise, be able to analyze our data. We're pretty good at collecting data, maybe not so good at analyzing what we have. Uh, it's hard to keep track of everything that's built up over the years. Uh, <clears throat> we also have a regional investigation service and they are reorganizing into two units, one to address major case management and the other operational. So they will specialize in particular techniques needed for more complex investigations. As well, we have a national aerial surveillance program and there's one plane dedicated to the Pacific Coast that does weekly flights. Actually, they fly as much as possible every day of the week and there will be a four member flight crew and one fishery officer on each of those flights. They attempt to cover the whole coast per week and the fishery officers involved will send out uh, uh, daily reports and weekly reports so they will monitor uh, the ground fish fleet and look for vessels that may be in closed areas uh, whether the seabird avoidance gear has de been deployed as applicable and um, forgotten what the other one is <laughs> and uh, they will also um, give us reports on the distribution of the fishing activity and then we are able to direct our fishery officers to where the most activity is occurring to monitor for compliance. Um, and then we also have a group, we have a Marine Security Ops Centre and it's a multiple agency group. We have four members of DFO there, two are fishery officers and two are analysts. They also help us out, for instance, with closed area reports. They've taken over those from our service provider and they also provide us with weekly uh, distribution of the fishing fleets so it gives us an idea of what's occurring out there. We do have a five-member aquaculture unit, which um, we're not, I'm not involved with them currently to a great degree, although we've had some reports that I need to follow up with regarding ground fish. So um, hopefully we will liaise with them more in the future. And then of course we have our service provider, uh, Archipelago, which is responsible for providing the at-sea observers, the EM systems and the dockside monitors. All of those processes or all of those people and the EM system generates occurrences which all fishery officers have access to. <clears throat> so for, I'll just summarize the priorities for 2015 for uh, the fishery officers in ground fish were closed areas unauthorized fishing and illegal sales, EM system failures, dual fishing, and dual fishing is where a commercially licensed vessel is permitted to uh, fish for food, social, and ceremonial fishing on the same trip. 
So they require particular, there's conditions of license. The vessel master is responsible for ensuring that he has a designation certificate from the particular First Nation involved. And we're also monitoring hails to ensure that the uh, vessel masters are complying with the conditions of license. So hailing out, hailing in. Um, and I'll, now I'll give a quick summary of the actual stats. So for commercial halibut, there were 57 occurrences in 2015. There were 1,845 dedicated halibut hours. There were, from the, the occurrences and the dedicated hours, 44 violations were found. Seven did not go forward after consultation internally and with our ground fish management unit. It was decided that we were unlikely to get charge approval. Uh, 14 charges are under review or pending. One went to native protocol. And this involves, we, in our, some of our com uh, comprehensive fishing agreements with our First Nations, there's enforcement protocols. So that particular case went that way. And 22 warnings were issued. The majority were for more administrative issues regarding dual fishing where the designation certificates weren't complete. So we're working on that by contacting vessel masters, contacting the First Nations, and trying to communicate uh, in a more effective way what is required there. As you can imagine, we have a quite diverse group coast-wide of First Nations. In our recreational halibut, there were 55 occurrences. There were 705 dedicated enforcement hours to halibut, and 78 violations were recorded. 13 charges laid, 20 are under review or pending. One was diverted alternative measures that it will be restorative justice process. 12 tickets issued and 42 warnings. Um, there were a, a fair number of fishers out there not recording halibut on their licenses, so they are, requ are required to do so. It's a condition of their license. We have an annual halibut limit of six. Um, this is a challenge for fishery officers to enforce. It is somewhat easier to enforce the daily limit and the position of possession limit, but not the annual. Uh, in our Aboriginal halibut, <clears throat> so this is including our uh, fish social fish. fish <laughs> I apologize. Um, food, social, and ceremonial fisheries. So 25 occurrences were generated. 717 dedicated hours to halibut enforcement and 12 violations found. Five charges are pending or under a review, the majority of which are illegal sales. One, there was one seizure of unmarked, unknown uh, gear, one ticket issued and five warnings. I'll just summarize what our aerial, aerial surveillance program um, in 2015, there were 973.5 hour flying hours. During that time, officers recorded and observed 417 halibut vessels. Of those, 316 were commercially licensed, 15 were combo boats, uh, halibut and sablefish, and 42 were our communal commercial licensed vessels. Um, and again, the weekly reports that are generated or the daily reports uh, fishery officers access on a regular basis. Uh, for instance, this past Friday, um, I had a look at the report. There's a map of the flight and distribution of the activity. And um, there were a couple of vessels fishing in closed areas. The detachment supervisors were notified right away. and. Um, I'm not sure what actions happened. I will be following up on that. But it's just an example of how that uh, aerial surveillance program can help. We're also looking at coordinating all these particular units I've discussed uh, within CMP. We had an excellent example of one of our Coast, new Coast Guard vessels working with a northern office and apprehended 
apprehending a long time halibut poacher. So we're really pleased with that. Um, a file's being put together and will shortly be submitted to Crown Council for charge approval. So in British Columbia, our Crown Councils have the final say whether charges will be approved or not. So the fishery officer will present the evidence and then they will make that decision. So, and that's about it from my end. So any further questions? I'll be happy to answer as best I can. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if you might tell us a little bit more about your restorative justice program and, and success of that program. Um, so okay, far. so it's a regional program. We have a coordinator. We go by the RCMP model by and large, which is a community justice forum. So the requirements are that the individual that's accused uh, admits to what they did was wrong. Uh, then we bring together a group of people that were impacted by the actions of the accused. So it may, it'll include a fishery officer, it'll include um, probably one of our resource managers, um, members of the public, maybe um, streamkeeper groups depending on where the incident occurred and that group will then decide amongst themselves after hearing from everybody. It's a very set process. There's actually a written script uh, it's quite a formal process. There's pre-interviews, and then the group will decide on what the consequences will be. So it can range from anything from uh, the person might be required to do community service to pay a large amount of money as potentially as like a fine to a particular group, um, and or it may be they have to write a letter of apology, and there's quite a range, so it's up to the group what they decide. Now, if the accused does not follow through with what the group has decided and what that person has agreed to, then we must have enough evidence that we can proceed to court. So that is another one of the criteria that must be met before you go that route. And we've had some real successes, actually. I think one positive outcome of this particular process is that everyone's involved in it and has a say, and whereas the criminal justice system that we take our um, cases through, it's much more hands-off, and often all parties are not satisfied with the results. So. We're finding that people start communicating, people start understanding what the impact of their actions are, and we're actually turning around some long-time non-compliers through this method. It doesn't work for everyone, that's why we have a court system, but there's certainly in the commercial, in the rec, and in the Aboriginal fisheries, we've had some real success over the years. Thank you, interesting. Other questions? So, so I don't know if you have the report in front of you, but I'm, I'm yes. confused by oh, okay. table four, which shows uh, percent effort in a variety of categories. And for example, oh, yes. so, so the total percentage is like less than 10%. It, look, it would look like, where's the other 90% of effort? Oh, I know, and I, I was anticipating this question. I think I actually have a printout of all our work elements. There's approximately 108 work elements. <laughs> now, not every fishery officer will be involved in every work element, but we have a, we're a very multitask group. And um, so the total hours spent are spread over all these different work elements, so fr ranging from um, it might be a species at risk investigation to a habitat to uh, wreck fish, commercial, aboriginal. Um, it's all fisheries, though. So. There's a huge variety. It's all, it's all fisheries. In, in, in those work elements? No, they're not all fisheries. I see. They, they also include uh, training, um, admin, everything. So that right. includes that everything. Makes sense. Thank you very yeah. much. Appreciate You're welcome. That. I see no more questions. Thank you very much for the report. So. Thank you. So uh, uh, are there commission comments or questions of the general area 2A or 2B reports we should discuss?
Um, just an observation, I guess, Jim. It, um, I was uh, very interested to hear from the 2A reports about uh, the increase or apparent increase of fish abundance in sounded like Washington, Oregon, and California <coughs> from uh, in 215 in comparison to 214. So view that quite positively. Thank you. I, I, that didn't show up that much in the survey, but you're correct. The report certainly showed that uh, success in the fisheries. So, so I think that we've completed what we can this afternoon. Uh, we will. S we don't want to get ahead of the agenda because there are quite a number of people interested in hearing the Amendment 80 report, which will be at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Um, I'm reluctant to jump around in the agenda because people may have particular issues they thought they would come in here. So I think we can uh, go home and read documents. Paul, please. Well, I have one item that probably most people wouldn't be interested in hearing about, but uh, we talked about the minutes for uh, the interim meeting and annual meeting. And so I had a chance to review them, Jim, and uh, I'm satisfied that they reflect. Um, that was for the 215 uh, interim and 215 annual. Thank you very much. I actually looked at them last night as well briefly, so I, I, nothing caught my eye. So is this take a motion, Bruce? So I'd entertain a motion to approve. I do. A second. Any discussions? If not, the motion to approve the minutes of the annual meeting and the interim meeting and the annual, the annual meeting last year and interim meeting are approved, so those are approved. Maybe I didn't ask if there's an objection. <laughs> Is anyone opposed to approving that? All in favor, say aye. That's aye. better. Aye. Motion passes. Yeah. So we can check those two off. Thank you, Paul, for calling that to my attention. Uh, we don't have the auditor's report here, do we? So I think we will adjourn. Uh, have a brief relaxation and then we'll be back in this building at seven o'clock. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone in the audience. <laughs>